right before we jump into this video, if you'd like me to send you a free guide to capturing motion in low light situations, just look for this orange box over on the website, put your name, email address in it, hit send it, and I'll send you that guide for free. Jared Poland, Fronos Photo. Dot com and this is a review of Tamron's 35 to 150 f2 to 2.8 lens. Now this is a thinker of a lens. And what do I mean by a thinker? It means that I'm actually thinking that this might be a good lens for me to have in my bag because never have we really seen a range of 35 to 150 in an f2 to 2.8. Normally when you see variable aperture mega-ish zoom lenses, they're crappy apertures and you're trading quality for weight and price. This is gonna be expensive and we'll talk about that at the end, but before we get into all of it, let me tell you what I photographed. I photographed a Rivals Sons concert. Now, I really liked this band. I never saw them before, but I reached out to the band on Instagram the day before to say, hey, look, I've got a new lens that is interesting that I'd like to try out and photograph a concert. Can I shoot the entire show? They got back to me and said, yes. Oh, I also let them know that all the Keeper images, I'm gonna send to you. You can use them for whatever you want. It's a trade-off. You give me access for the whole show and I'm gonna give you these great pictures, well, hopefully, that are great pictures. So I got to shoot that entire concert at the Fillmore, which was a challenge because the lighting was, of course, challenging. And I also photographed kids outside. We have little Dan and little Dan's friend running around the park and, and it was an overcast day and I think that is a great juxtaposition to have low light concert and kids outside. So let's get to the outside of the lens. When you pick it up, you're like, huh, there's some heft to it. That's because it weighs in at 2.57 pounds or 1165 grams. Now it's, it's bigger and it's heavy-ish, but for what you're getting with a 35 to 150, I think it's a pretty interesting trade-off because look at this. You're replacing how many lenses if you put this in your bag or getting close to replacing. You're replacing a 35, a 50, an 85, a 105, a 135, and basically a 70 to 200 or a 70 to 180 with one lens that gives you two to 2.8. I just keep coming back to that because it's awesome. All right, this is your lens hood. Please use your lens hood. If you're gonna shoot anything, just put the lens hood on. It's not like it's the biggest lens hood in the world, so you may end up getting a little more flare at some point. In terms of millimeters, we've got an 82 millimeter lens cap, an 82 millimeter filter thread. That means you can put a polarizing filter on there, an ND filter, whatever you need to put on, on the outside, you'd get an 82 millimeter. But the good news about having an 82 millimeter filter of any kind is you could always get a step down ring to work with your 72 millimeters or your 68. If that's what you have, you can always step it down from there so that's good uh, you have your zoom ring right here this is a tighter zoom ring now you're not getting lens creep you know you're not getting lens creep but that also means that it's on the tighter side so it's sometimes a little harder to turn whereas with the new sony 70 to 200 2.8 i can just use my thumb to rotate it i actually need to pinch to rotate it here. So is that a deal breaker? No, just know that it's gonna take a little bit of torque to twist this lens to zoom it. In terms of switches on the side, we have an AF to manual, and we have one that says custom one, two, and three. When I first got this lens, I was like, where's the VR or IS switch to turn it on and off and change the different modes? Because when I first saw this, I thought that's, that's what that switch was for. And the truth of the matter is this lens does not have image stabilization built in but that's all right. That would just make it even more expensive and that would also make it even larger. So there's always a trade-off at play. But what are these custom switches for? I actually had to call Tamron because I had no clue. What they do is they allow you to set the different function buttons on the side here a, a specific way. So the example they gave me was for video that if I wanted to rack focus and I wanted to press the button, I wanted it to be programmed to this place, 
and then something in the background. So it was a, a way to quickly do that and you have three different modes to do that. I personally don't actually like these buttons on the lens and I'll tell you why, because when I'm shooting, it's in the perfect place for my thumb or my forefinger to accidentally press the button, which the way that I had my Sony A1 set would deactivate the autofocus. It would basically lock it in right where it was until I moved my finger. So I need to go into the A1 here and I need to turn off these buttons from doing anything because personally I don't like using them. There's only a couple more things to talk about on this lens. We've got a lock switch right here, the lock switch right here. Yeah, it wouldn't lock unless you're all the way at the 35 millimeters. So now it's locked in. So if it's in your bag, it's not gonna shift at all, but it's really not gonna, I don't even know why there's a lock switch. To be honest, it's not that easy to, uh, you know, do anything with this lens, obviously. It's not gonna automatically just creep on you. Now there is a USB dock down here built in. It's USB-C. Now there's no cover is what Steven mentioned, but I was like, well, we always have our phone out and our phone doesn't have a cover for the, the USB-C or whatever the dongle is that you have on it. I don't think that's that big of a deal, but it's also pretty cool that you can update the firmware right here on the lens. One of the more questionable things in the past with third-party lenses, Tamron, Sigma, and others, when attaching to an E-mount body or any body for that matter, is how's the auto focus? It, it used to be a little slower because it's not a native lens. So Tamron has what's called a VXD motor or voice coil extreme torque drive. That's the voice coil extreme torque drive. That's right. It's just really good marketing. But what is it? It's linear motors. It's the ones that go back and forth like this. Very similar to what Sony has. Sony actually puts in quad linear motors into some lenses now. They used to do dual linear motors. So it just, it's a different way of focusing that's not screw motors, which were much slower to move focus. Uh, in this case, for my tests, I think the focusing was fine. I think it's good enough. It's better than good enough. Do I think it's the most perfect thing in the world? No, but it, it didn't hold me back from getting pictures with the A1. All right, so let's get into the pictures. Like I said, I use the Sony A1 here, but being that this is for an E-mount system, you can use it on an A7 III. You can use it on an A7C. You can use it on any camera that has an E-mount from Sony. So right off the bat, this was the opener for Rival Sons. I'm sorry, I don't recall the guy's name right now, but they had the lights set perfectly. They left it this way. It was just this guy, there was no band with him. And so they left the light set perfect and it was awesome. Here I am at 110 millimeters. I mean, I'm in the pit and I'm able to go from 35 to 150 and have an F2 to 2.8. That is just mind blowing that I could have this one lens in the pit and get great results. The focus was spot on. I used IAF uh, with the A1 and the colors and the tones and the sharpness looks absolutely fantastic with those. Let me jump in here real quick because I want to show you this photo taken with the 35 to 150 Tamron and edited with Fropac 3 to start. Let's go with Fifth Element Matte Finish. I really like the feel of that one as well as Canadian Tuxedo because I like those Canadians. Then we've got Capone. It kind of pulls out that color but it really accentuates the subject here. Then we've got King Contrast, boom. That looks great, followed by Mount Airy, which is a light and airy look. But let me go back up here into Fro Pack 2 because I wanna show you double stuffed Oreos. This is double stuffed Oreos, and with one click, it looks a little harsh, but all I need to do is just brighten it up, and I think that looks great. And to finish it off, if you're looking for something that's universal, that works with just about everything, we've got a great starting point in Universal Soldier. So look, if you're looking to speed up your raw workflow or give yourself a great starting point, we created 15 custom Lightroom presets that you can check out right now at fronosphoto.com slash fropack3. While you're over there, you can play with the sliders to see the befores and the afters. And if you decide to pick them up right now, they are currently on sale. Or if you want to get the entire Fropack triple play bundle, you can do that right now and save even more. Now, let's get back to the video. Now this one is at 35 millimeters and you may notice that I'm at 2.8. And you're like, Jared, it's a 35 F2, why are you at 2.8? Well, I didn't realize that when I set, the camera was set to 2.8 the last time I used it. And so 
If you don't set it to F2, like dial it down when you're at 35, it doesn't know that you want to go to F2 until you tell it. But once you tell it that you want it to be F2 when you're at 35, and when you zoom out, it's going to go to 28. And when you zoom all the way back, it's going to go back to F2 automatically. With that being said, in our tests, we saw that at 39 millimeters is the last part where you get F2. At first, I thought you were just going to get F2 at 35 or 36, but it takes you out to roughly 39 millimeters. And after that point, you go to F2.2 all the way up to about 60 millimeters. And then you go from 80 to 150 roughly is where you're going to get 2.8. That's not bad at all. Usually when you see these variable aperture lenses that say that there are 2.8 to 4, they're 2.8 at like 35 millimeters. And then as soon as you breathe, it's going to 3 or 3.5 or F4. And, and so to have it have a little bit of range wide open F2 from 35 to 38 or 39 is pretty darn good. So that's the explanation on that. Uh, is 35 wide enough? The answer is for most situations, yes. I do feel like I would have liked to have been a little wider at some point, And that's where you may want to carry around an extra lens like a Sigma 14 to 24 2.8. That could be a good compromise, that and this. But you have to think about when they're building a lens like this, what is a really usable range? Because look, We've got this lens right here from Canon, and Canon is one of the companies that has been getting really creative with different types of focal lengths. This is a 28 to 70 F2. It's chody, it's heavy. At 28, it's F2. At 70, it's F2. I never expected Tamron to come out with something like this that's a 35 to 150. This is an awesome range to have. No, you're not at F2 all the way through, but you're also going all the way out to 150 millimeters, and it's only a 2.8. So that's really good. Good on uh, good on Tamron for getting creative here. I'm surprised that, that so Sony hasn't done something like this because this range I'm super impressed with because it's replacing all of those other lenses in my bag and giving me so many different options. This one's at 68 millimeters at 2.5. Just love the colors and love the tones. He's not moving very far, so the focus wasn't being, you know, challenged too much, but it was nailing what needed to be nailed. Just look at the background here. I'm only at 43 millimeters, but I'm filling the frame really well, and the background's being blown out at f2.2. You know, normally you'd be at 2.8 with the lenses that you'd be shooting with in the pit, unless you're using primes, but there is a difference between f2.2 and 2.8. It's noticeable when you see it. It's a difference between having a snapshot and a photograph. That's what you're getting when you isolate your subjects, and that's the importance of having a fast aperture. Of course, it all comes at a price, and it's all a trade-off, and you have to decide what's right for you. But for me in the pit, this was absolutely fantastic, because here I am at 35 at f2 this time around, and I'm loving the results that I got out of it. You just get a nice separation. And this, this was challenging when the rival suns came on. They didn't have the blazing lights the whole time. Sometimes it was blue and it was a little darker. Sometimes it was red. It was an absolute challenge. That's why I'm shooting at 6400 ISO. And sometimes I was off by a stop or a stop and a half, but I was able to bring that back in the raw file. But now is also a good time to mention that because it's a variable aperture lens, as you zoom, your aperture is changing, which means you're losing light the more you zoom out. So that's something you need to keep in your mind that it's going to get darker. If you go from 35 at f2 right out to 150, it's going to automatically change the aperture from 2 to 2.8 and you're losing light. So if you're a manual shooter like I am, you're just going to have to see that in your mind and quickly dial it down. But honestly, if you're off by that little bit, you'll be able to bring it back. Um, some people will shoot auto ISO. Some people will shoot with aperture priority. That's not me, especially for concerts. Actually, that's not me for anything at this point. Uh, I, I just compensate, right? If I see it happening, you know it's going to get a little darker. I'll just quickly dial the shutter speed down just a little bit to open up by that stop, and I'm good to go. Uh, I'm, I'm happy with these results. This is shooting right into the backlight, or the light that's shining through him. I'm not seeing any issues with that whatsoever. You can download these sample RAW files yourself over on the website. You can play with them. You can see if you like the quality that, that I was able to get out of it to help you decide if this is a lens for you. But the colors and tones, I think, are perfectly fine. This is what 150 millimeters gives you in the pit. I mean, the fact that I don't have to switch lenses 
at all is pretty mind blowing, especially if you only get three songs during a concert. I was able to, to shoot the whole show so I could just focus a little more and go a little slower. But look, at 150, we nailed the eye right there. That left eye looks to be perfectly in focus even though his eyes are closed. And we're at 28, so we have a little bit of leeway right there and it's perfectly fine. A couple more from the concert. I was off by two stops on this bad boy because there was no front light, but I was able to bring it back. 35 millimeters F2, and the cool thing is that helps you bring the ISO down just a little bit if you need to, because you have that F2, you don't have to compensate by going up higher and being at 8,000 or 10,000 or 12,800 when you can gather a little bit more light. Except if you're off by two stops, you could have just done that. In this case, I was, but it happens fast. Um, but I'm happy with the way that this image turned out. This is what 35 gives you on the wider side. So I'm at 35 at F2. You just have to make sure you're focused on the person you want to have in focus because multiple people aren't gonna be in focus at F2. This is a good range at 35. Would I like to have seen a little bit wider at some point? Yes, I would have liked to have been able to go a little bit wider because I couldn't back up all the way in the pit, but the trade-off would be maybe this lens would have been a 28 to 135 but they decided to go with the 35 to 150 which I kind of fell in love with the results that I was getting from it just like this you've got 48 millimeters at f2 it's kind of perfect for shooting concerts. Now, I didn't mention this earlier, but if you're someone who likes bokeh blades, there's nine of them in here. Steven always has me mention that. Uh, I, I always talk about not caring about blades, but if you care about that, it's got nine aperture blades. Let me jump in here real quick and say, would you like to take better pictures in only 11 days? Well, I created a free mini video course that you can sign up for right now at fronosphoto.com slash 11 days. So next, I wanted to get outside. We had low light shooting a concert, and then now we have outside photographing kids on an overcast day in the park. And, and I chose to put on the Atomos Ninja 5 so that you could see the focusing points in action, to see them moving. Do they keep up? Are they sticky? Is it in focus? And I wanted to shoot that way so that you could see the results. Uh, this is little Dan's friend was out in the park. I got permission to photograph his little friend here. And I, I mean, the colors look great. The depth looks, I'm at 60 millimeters, we're at f2.5. You're not getting that with a 2.8 lens. Obviously, you're not getting that with a 2.8 lens. But at 69 millimeters, we're at 2.5. Look at the separation you're getting from the background. It just isolates your subject so much more. Now, do you like the color or do you like the black and white version? I know that most people are going to be torn because in some cases, I like the color because that, that pink pops. And in other cases, I think the black and white looks absolutely classic. I, I mean, I love the tones that we're getting here. Nice and sharp, the black and whites look great, the focus is spot on. This is 35 millimeters at f2. Look at the isolation. The people in the background, they're not distracting. But let's look at 150. This is the same one color, this is 150. So this is 150 millimeters, this one is 35. What an absolute incredible range. If you're gonna do portraits in the park, you can do everything from 35 to 150 and get great results. Look at the sharpness in the eyes. Look at the nice reflections, the tones, the colors, everything that I was able to pull out of it was great. Yeah, I'm shooting with an A1, but this is gonna be very similar on an A7 III. It's gonna be similar on an A7 IV. It doesn't matter what camera you're gonna use, you're gonna be able to pull out very similar results because basically, have the same auto focusing systems and the same processors. Continuing on out in the park, I mean, just look at this little kid right here. We're at 37 millimeters, still at F2, so it shows you in the real world, we got 37 millimeters at F2, and the separation is what we're talking about. Even if you had Tamron's 28 to 75 to 8, you're not gonna get the same separation at the distance I was shooting right here. Having that 2 and that 2.2 two and 2.5 is gonna separate your images so much better from the competition or from a mega zoom kit lens and that's why this is such a thinker of a lens because it makes you think that oh my god this might replace a lot of stuff in my bag there's always trade-offs we're going to get to discussing more of that at the very end but let's let's keep showing you the images look this kid wasn't moving very fast the other two kids they were running around because they're like four or five years old this one was like 13 months old and was just like learning to walk which is great for taking portraits because they can't go very far but i love absolutely love the tones here just 
The background is not distracting, and that's what separates, in my opinion, photo snapshots from photographs. You see it all the time. People that just set the camera on auto and take pictures, they're just taking pictures, or they use a kit lens, and it's just, yeah, it's fine. And I mean, I saw it even with the 28 to 75 Tamron that I'm also reviewing. It's fine, but it's not as great as this. And so I, I'm, I mean, the separation here, getting close, the focus nailing, the, f uh, the, the speed being fine, I'm really happy, as you can tell. The black and white tones, great. Uh, and, and the last image right here is little Dan on the swing, framing this at 35 millimeters at F2, tracks him as he was swinging on the swing, and, and it just nailed it. So this, I never expected to think that this was a lens that I would personally want to buy. And I think the truth of the matter is, I do want to buy this. Now this is an $1,899 lens. It is expensive, but think about what you're replacing two to four to five different lenses in your bag. Back in the day when people would say, what lenses should I start with? I would say the quicker you can get a 24 to 70 and a 70 to 200, or in the Tamron's case, a 28 to 75 and a 70 to 180, I thought that was a great place to start. But to get an F2 option to 2.8, to go from 35 to 150, I mean, that almost says, I don't think you need a 28 to 75 and a 70 to 180. Now those are much lighter, right? So they're lighter and they're 2.8s all the way through. They're a little less expensive and it's probably less expensive to purchase both of those than to purchase this. But today, if someone was shooting a wedding, I think you could shoot an entire wedding day with this. The trade-off, you're not getting a 35-1-2. You're not using a 50-1-2. You're not using a 50-1-8, an 85-1-8 or 1-4-1-2. You don't have those. But if I was to go to, say, Disney World with my future kids, you guys hear that? We're going to Disney one day. You, yeah, you. Yeah, not you, you're not good, but the other one, you're gonna go to Disney one day. This could be a lens that a professional photographer or an advanced amateur could be like, you know what? I don't wanna take a full bag of glass, but I can still get the results that I'm used to, that I want, with something like this. I would be happy to carry this. If I was to traveling, if I was to go to Italy again and I had this lens, I'm probably taking this over taking the 35, one, two, the 50, and the, uh, the 135, one, eight that I took. I would have just taken this. Instead, I had the ZFC and an A1, and the ZFC had a 16 to 50 plastic lens, which is not exactly a great lens, it's a kit lens. I'm really happy with the results that I got, but I just don't get the separation from that kit lens. Now, before I forget, let's do the sniff test and the wind tunnel test, because if it doesn't do well in these, I maybe can't recommend it. Steven, sniff test or wind tunnel? Sniff. Sniff, okay. Oh my God, it smells like Tinkerbell's it smells like Tinkerbell's, uh, it smells like Tinkerbell. I, I love Tinkerbell and that that's a good thing. So that's a good smell. Let, let's, let's wind tunnel test it. I got, I got to get a good, a good run running start at this. It didn't even move. It passed the wind tunnel test. All right. So what do you guys think about this? Would you replace a bunch of lenses in your bag with something like this? I don't think it's gonna replace primes for me if I've got the time to shoot, but if I'm traveling and I just wanna take one lens, I honestly think I'm going to buy this lens. I'm going to buy this lens at Allen's camera because I got a lot of credit there from selling all my Nikon gear, and so I think this is the lens that I'm gonna add to my bag for all the reasons that I said. If you're starting out today and you can afford the $1,899, I think that this would be a really good option to start with. No, you're not gonna be able to shoot sports at a distance like soccer because you're only stopping at 150, but 150 is still really good. You're indoors shooting basketball, this is gonna be pretty darn good. The focus is gonna keep up pretty well and you're gonna have a nice range. It's not gonna be the end all be all for everything, but portraits for landscape photos, for uh, anything that's gonna be closer in tight to you, but geez, 150 gives you a pretty good reach. And that's why I am changing my past thinking and saying that if you're starting off today, I mean, to get something that's F2 and to get 35 F2, to get 152.8, this is gonna be an incredible range 
to have when you're starting out. So that's where I'm going to leave it. Thank you very much for watching. Jared, polinfronosphoto.com. See ya.